As Dave Chappelle once said, The Celebration! In celebration of Figure It Outie hitting 5,000 subscribers for the channel by the time that this video is posted, I've got a special discount just for Figure It Outie viewers at the end of this video from one of the biggest retailers of aftermarket Audi parts from one of the community's most favorite vendors. It's time. Perfect. Perfect. I know you've seen it in the background and no one's been anticipating this project more than I have, but after a couple months here of digging in to see what the condition of things are, buying parts and generally just getting life out of the way so I can do this, it's finally time to tuck into the S4 here. So I know usually I do DIY content on this channel, but that's not the case here. We're gonna be approaching this like a build series. And that's not to say that I won't be going deep on the product and showing you all the cool stuff about it because I will, but it's not gonna be like a step-by-step -step installation thing because we just don't have time. And that's the reality of this too. There's two deadlines I'm working against here. One is that, you know, I'm not a full-time YouTuber. I'd love to be, but I have a pretty demanding nine to five job that I definitely need to pay attention to. But also I've got a really big project coming here to the garage in about three weeks. So this car has to be running in three weeks. So what you're gonna find is that I'm out here all times a day trying to scrape together hours where I can find them. I'll look terrible wearing different kind of stuff, but that's just me trying to grind away and get this project done. Some of these clips might be out of order chronologically, but you'll get the idea. So before I get into the project goals and what I'm doing, let me talk about why I'm doing anything at all. Check this out. So this is the auxiliary radiator that usually sits down on the passenger side down there. And it's upside down right now. So this is the bottom end tank. And looky there, there's like a two or three inch long hairline crack and it was leaking. So when I bought the car, I knew it was leaking a little bit of coolant, uh, but it was kind of weird because it wasn't until the car warmed up and of course got pressurized um, is when I saw more and more. But that makes sense, right? It started pushing the coolant out. But when the car wasn't running, there was maybe like one drop a day. And it took me a while to figure out what exactly was going on. I had to take the front carrier off and really go digging around in there. So eventually figured it out and it was this. And while I was deciding what else to do, I was like, well, I can see everything. So let me check it out really good, see what else is failing on me, and maybe what else can I upgrade? So the project goals then. Now in comparison to my old A4, which I did need to winter drive and it had to be reliable, and just in my opinion, that's not the engine platform that you should invest you know, the nth degree of money into to get performance out of, this car feels a little different. First of all, this is kind of collectible, but I'd really like it to be the first of many cars, hopefully, in my long-term collection. If I can help it, I'm never gonna sell this car. The other thing is, it is sort of like a, a representation of a time in Audi where they were still making traditional muscle cars. You know, they hadn't gone to forced induction yet in the S4. They still felt like a six-speed manual was the way to go. And they were like, hell, eight cylinders, that'll do the trick. The other thing is, it's not an RS4, and I kind of like that. From here on out, this car is not getting winter-driven anymore. And I'm prepared to sacrifice a little bit of comfort for performance by slowly turning this thing into a mean-sounding daily street car that can keep up with a lot of the turbo GDM cars running around these days and some more modern German sedans. But I've never been one of those car owners that starts right off the bat with bolt-ons to chase horsepower. I get it, it's fun, it's easier, but honestly with a car this old, I think you're asking for trouble if you don't address some of those core support systems that just keeps the car running. And for me, the most important one is always cooling. No matter what you do, you want good oil temps, oil capacity, and general reliability in your entire cooling system. Therefore, goal number one in the spirit of replacing this terribly cracked radiator is find a way to get more efficiency out of the cooling system and do a full reliability refresh. Goal number two, and as evidenced by this nice grease cake all over the front of the block and especially by the valve covers, is find all oil leaks and find a way to increase the efficiency of the oiling system. Finally, goal number three, Yes, it's gotta be a little bit of performance, right? But it's gonna be while I'm in there performance. You know, there is gonna be an engine pull in this car's future, no doubt, and I'd love to build it up into an absolute monster. But for now, while things are apart, what can we do to squeeze out some nice, easy performance that's just sitting there ready for the taking? Now, those three goals aside, I've made sure that I know exactly what I wanna do to make sure that I can get this thing running again in that three week timeline. And roughly speaking, here's the list. And you'll notice that I broke it out in some pretty uh, important milestones. Engine can run, just get the engine running. It can't drive under its own power yet. It can't drive safely, but this is all the stuff that needs to happen just to get it running. 
and actually that up there too. Then there's a couple more things so that it can drive. Then there's a few final things where it's reliable, and then I have a few special things at the end to make it look a little extra nice. Now, just before we kick off into the work here, sit rep. Obviously, I've done a lot of work here. This isn't a video where we're gonna be starting from scratch and you're gonna watch me the whole way. In fact, we're about to put stuff on, so you get to join me at the fun part here. But I wanna give you an indication of how much of a heat monster that I'm finding these engines to be. So I have taken off a lot of the cooling components because I'm gonna replace them, but I found so many hoses that were swollen from being soaked in oil and then heated. I'm still trying to clean that all up and figure out what the total damage impact was. But check these things out. So there's actually little wires on here that I'm seeing that have their, uh, their covers cracked from the heat. The injector harness here got a little bit of oil on it and uh, it cracked as well under the heat. I found bits of plastic spread all around the intake manifold and down under where the valley pan was. But just to give you an impression of how much heat is coming off of this thing, look at the condition of the intake manifold gaskets in the valley pan gasket. Truly bubbling under its own heat. There was so much of the black coating that had already cracked off, I had to razor it very carefully off of the, the edge of the heads. And it just gives you an indication of how much heat these things are putting out. Party time. Just like the list says, first up here, degrease block and stuff. Now I can already tell that I'm gonna get confused trying to put this all back together because I'm gonna be taking out more things here that are intertwined already, but I need to get them out of the way so I can clean everything up. So I need your help, honestly. I need all of you guys who have done projects like this before to, to watch out for me and let me know when something's going back in the wrong way or when I call for help, give me some pointers, run out to the garage and check your car because I'm gonna take a lot of pictures along the way, but I know I'm gonna get some of this stuff wrong on the reinstall. Anyways, I am going to tuck into this with some safe degreasers and get my little shop vac out here to clean it up because I wanna dispose of this carefully. But I wanna clean up everything stuck to the front of the block in these little intricate spots in here. I wanna clean everything up so when I'm done and if there is a new leak, I know exactly where it's coming from. Let's do a product test, shall we? So in preparation for this cleaning here, I've got everything that's important up out of the way or it's taped off, so we're all cool there. And I went to Canadian Tire and I was looking for a degreaser that I could use anywhere. And I found two things. Well, I found a couple and I couldn't make up my mind, really. But one, there's gunk. I like using gunk products and this one's biodegradable, which I like. But then also, I like cool purple looking bottles. So I grabbed some of the Super Clean, also biodegradable. And I figured, let's just do a little test here for fun. Taped off in the middle. I'm gonna go have dinner, but first I'm gonna soak both sides. And let's just see what it looks like over time here, eating into this first layer of grease. And then I'll continue to use it on both sides and let's just see which one works better. So I let it soak on there for about 15 minutes, like it says to, and not too much action. Not surprising though, it's all good. I knew I had to put some elbow grease into that. So here we go with my scrub brushes and I'll see you on the other side of the cleaning. Thirty-six hours later, and a lot of, and I mean literally, toothbrush and Q-tip cleaning. Boom! Look at that. Look how nice and clean this turned out. I'll give you a good look at the the before and after here. So before, after, before, after. Obviously, this is the side that we used the gunk on, and super clean was over here. In my opinion, they were very similar. I don't think one cleans better than the other. Although I will say that uh, after a little bit of time using gunk, and of course it does say to use it in a ventilated area, and I did kind of have some ventilation going on, it was really noxious smelling. Uh, it kind of gave me a headache, and I ended up actually switching over to the Super Clean to do some more intricate parts, just because it was sort of a more user-friendly product to use. So there's my vote. Super Clean is pretty good for stuff like this. But yeah, this came out so great. Here's also a little bit of uh, B-roll that I'm not gonna use, but it shows you the, the gunk in the back part. Look how nice all of this came out in here. Just absolutely glimmering. So that's awesome. This gives me a great place to uh, start working back from and I can start putting down some gaskets now. However, after I finished all that work, I totally forgot that there are a ton of bolt-on parts uh, that are still really dirty. And honestly, I'm sort of out of steam. I really wanna move on to some other stuff. 
And sometimes you just got to uh, get help from people who are good at other things and have nice tools. So I'm actually gonna drop off a lot of these cast aluminum parts here for uh, dry ice cleaning and vapor honing. So what I've got is a thermostat part of the water pump assembly, uh, the middle part of the water pump assembly, valley pan, the oil filter housing, this gross alternator snub mount, and the alternator bracket. And I've actually got some nice spherical end links in here as well. And uh, hopefully they'll come back minty clean and I don't have to put all that scrubbing time in. So while those parts are off getting cleaned up for a couple days, I can move on to some other stuff, namely fixing the problem that caused that huge grease mess in the first place, the valve cover gaskets. Now I've got a whole set here ready to go from L-Ring, including some fresh tacos. I don't know what those are, I just like calling them tacos because they look like it. So I'll do those all at once, and uh, I'm gonna do something maybe smart, maybe stupid, but I've noticed that the PCV system, so the breather hoses here on the back of each of the valve covers, it's all connected, and all these other parts are loose. So instead of breaking these ear clamps right here, and I mean, I could put them back on pretty quick, but I'm actually gonna see if I can lift off all the valve covers and the PCV in one piece and just be done with it. Kind of funny because my expectations and muscle memory on working on these cars comes from the a4 where there were you know half as many valve covers and it was sticking straight up in the middle so you probably saw me struggling in that time lapse trying to get at the uh, valve cover bolts down at the back there and uh, just in case you guys don't have things like this i use a lot of mini ratcheting bit wrenches things that can fit in tight spots and you just load a bit directly into it and they've got lots of teeth inside and you can get you know just a little bit of rotation when you need to and uh, it helps you out in spots like this. Anyways, while we have the valve covers off, we have the opportunity to look at some other stuff that's exposed right now. So looking into at least the tops of the heads and the condition of the intake and exhaust cams on both sides, they look good, in my limited experience anyways. So looking at the condition of the lobes, just kind of feeling it with my finger and nail. They don't look scored at all, even in minor ways, so that is kind of reassuring. And granted, the heads are on a slant here, so of course oil is going to be draining to the outside. But I don't see any concentrated deposits built up in any sections necessarily, and uh, that makes me a little bit more hopeful too. And then, of course, timing is exposed, at least at the tops. And I stuck my head in a flashlight in there just to see if there's any bits of, you know, a cracked uh, guide for the tops of the tensioners here. There's nothing. The rest of the guides down there, from what I can see, look okay. There's lots of tension on the chain still. And generally speaking, that just makes me hopeful about the condition of the rest of the timing system because that's not something I'm gonna be getting into for at least a year, probably. Last, just a little look at the gaskets themselves. They got a little crunchy. I mean, there's a piece here that broke off and it's, it's hard, it really is. So I think it was just time to change them out and looking at the heads, there aren't too many spots where you can't see oil that has been pressed through the, the gaskets. So it's simply time to switch them out, although I will, observe that uh, there's some crustiness on the top part of the boots on all of the coil packs that have gone on to the right side of the car here. And you can see corresponding grossness inside of there. So I don't know if someone just took a pressure washer and was trying to blast everything out and they were sitting water just kind of tucked under the top of the, the packs here, but uh, I'll keep an eye out for that in the future too. Otherwise, I did notice one other interesting thing, which is when you're doing stuff like this, you get to see part numbers on all the things you take off. The good news is that all the uh, coil packs are the T revision, which is the newest one, which is great. And then this is reverse right now. So the left valve cover is version AC, which is the newest out of three uh, total versions. But this other one here is S. So there's actually four other valve cover revisions that came after this one. And I wonder what the changes are. If you know what they are, let me know because uh, I have a tendency to want to always have the newest revision of something, especially when it's been revised so many times. 
So if you know what the changes were, uh, maybe it was to release some of the pressure in the, uh, the head to send out to the PCV system, total guess, but let me know if you know what the changes were. I really can spend hours in the garage sometimes looking at stuff like that, but I gotta get back to work. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean up the surface here where the gaskets are gonna mate to, get all that stuff reinstalled on the valve covers and put it all back in. Two more nights have gone by of some very careful cleaning, but now we have nice squishy gaskets everywhere. I've cleaned up the rubber grommets on the outside of all the valve cover bolts. So these are done, ready to go. And I spent a lot of time cleaning up the heads here too. Especially I have been cleaning the ridges where the little tacos sit in on the front. That was pretty easy, but out back behind the head, that took quite a bit of care as well. So finally, we are ready. Pew pew! Dual wheeled install. Pew! So with this work behind me now, I get to cross off something from my list. I was actually forgot it before anyways, but boom, that counts. And actually I get to do one more too, because I also picked up all the parts that I sent out for cleaning. And here's a quick little sneak peek. Boom, look at that, so nice. It's almost nicer than brand new. So I found a place on Instagram actually here in the city in Edmonton called Sublime Surfacing. I'm throwing up a nice little example of an RS2 Avant that came through the shop at some point, but basically over there they do rust protection, metal plating, dry ice cleaning, and vapor honing. And that's exactly what some of these parts went through to get this clean. Let me give you a closer look at some of this stuff. Now the alternator was the super dirty one, if you remember, and because it is so electrical in nature, it can't get blasted with media because there's just two fine particles of media that will get trapped inside of here that I won't be able to get out. So this got cleaned majorly with dry ice blasting. And as far as I can tell, that is truly exactly what it sounds like. You're shooting dry ice at it and it erodes the surface to get all the dirty stuff off of it. And what I'm finding here is that it actually also smooths out the surface a bit too. Something that was a little bit porous before becomes a touch bit smoother. But look at that. Can't imagine how much time I would have had to put into this to get it this clean. And for all these other parts here, whether it is steel, like the very end of this plug right here, or any kind of normal cast aluminum or magnesium, you can vapor hone it. And that is not unlike any other media blasting as far as I know, other than the fact it is water mixed in with very tiny glass beads. And of course it's enough to clean up the surface, but it also sort of grinds down the high points, like I said before, and gives you this really nice polished finish to the point where it looks nicer than OEM. You know, if this was on the car, someone would think it's brand new. You would never guess that this is a used part. Just a quick peek at these two. I didn't show you before because they were in the Ziploc bag, but the car actually came with 034 Motorsport spherical end links for the rear sway bar. And I had no idea when I took these out, I was just like, oh cool, I have really nice end links in the car. But I didn't even realize what brand they were. So these are all cleaned up now and all the threads can spin. But look for a future video where I actually do something to protect these because the great part about all of this is that it's nice and clean and shiny today but this is very much susceptible to corroding now at this point. So I need to do something about that. So that's it for the work on this first episode of the build series. And now finally, to give that discount to jhmotorsports.com, 5% off anything you put in the cart for the 5,000 subscriber celebration for Figure It Outy. FIA5 is your code. Go buy yourself a supercharger. Go buy yourself a lightweight crank pulley. How about lightweight brake rotors, even maintenance parts? Anything that you put in the cart, 5% off, FIA5, it's all yours. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this new format of a build series on the channel here. If you learned something and enjoyed the content, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. And what's that over my shoulder there? Maybe that'll be in the scenes from the next episode.